Unfortunately, uh, Scott Gruy is not here yet, and he's the one with the ADA. So if he doesn't get on by the time we do the ADA update, which is first, then I think we'll just switch the order, if that's okay with you guys. Yep. And we'll go to the training and see if, what's that? I don't think we're recording, right? No, we're not, but we are now. Okay, Eric, is, or can we get it going? Oh, I see it. Okay. Okay. Oh, good. Go ahead. Um, we're ready to go then, Jana? Yes. Okay. Um, we would like to call the Thursday, November 5th Multimodal Transportation Board that is virtual to order just at 602. Um, if we could go through the roll call, please. Yeah, and I'm I'm gonna ask your city and state while I'm doing the roll call. That's a new rule that we have to do. So just let me know where you are. Uh, Johanna Slanga. Here in uh, Bloomfield, Michigan. Andrew Haig. Tom Peard. Here in sunny Birmingham, Michigan. Katie Schaefer. Here, I'm in Birmingham, Michigan. Doug White. Here in Birmingham, Michigan. Joe Zane. Here. I am currently in Onaway, Michigan. Okay. Okay. Uh, going back to the agenda here. Um, any introductions, Laura? I mean, or Jana? Uh, nope. Nobody new today. Okay. Uh, hopefully, we had all a chance to review the agenda. If we could proceed to the approval of the minutes from the October first. <clears throat> We need to make a motion to approve the minutes from October 1st. Motion to approve the minutes from October 1st. Is there a second? We'll second the motion. Okay. All in favor, we're going to go through roll call, I think, right, Laura? Yeah. Doug White. Here. What is this one? Minutes. Oh, minutes. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> Katie Schaefer. Yes. Johanna Slinger? Yes. Joe Zane? Yes. Tom Peard? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, still don't see the commander on yet. So does that mean, Jana, we'd like to switch topics to best practice training session? Yes. If we could maybe go with uh, the training session and start there and uh, see if Commander Gruy is going to join us. And um, uh, Brad, is it going to be you presenting or Ben? Uh, oh. ben, ben to start, and then I'll take over, and Julie will be contributing uh, input or answering questions. And some of the images we have uh, were provided by Julie. So. Okay, I'm uh, going to add you all as co-hosts then, so you can all share screens if uh, you would like to. Okay. Ben, you are already a co-host if you want to share your screen. Can you all see my screen? And no. here, oh, actually not yet. How about now? <laughs> there you go. Now, now we can there see we your screen. Great. So, hi everyone. Um, thanks for taking the time to join us. It's been quite an eventful week so far. Um, so a couple months ago, the board indicated that a training like this would be useful for, so the city asked us to put a session together. We've done some trainings like this in the past, but there's been turnover in the board since then. So we used a survey to solicit input from the board about what types of projects you all want to learn more about. And we got, um, we had five respondents to the survey. And so we focused the presentation on street design elements that we think would be applicable to Birmingham and based on the survey results. So I'm gonna talk about head crossings and bicycle facilities, and then Brad will be covering traffic calming and shared and open streets. And Julie is also here to help answer questions at the end. And Julie, feel free to jump in at any point to add something. 
Um, and even though transit was part of the initial survey, we elected not to talk about it in depth today since we need, um, we think we need more coordination with SMART and the Regional Transit Authority so that we can tell you more about how certain amenities and service improvements get funded and what the current situation is on Woodward. Um, and so before we get into the content, here's a list of questions that we'd like you to think about as we talk through these different treatments and, um, and design elements. So would this make more sense on a downtown street or intersection or on a collector street or a neighborhood street? What are some locations you could imagine this being implemented? What are the potential pros and cons of implementation? Um, in what situations would something be worth the money to implement or maybe not worth the, the money if funding is hard to come by? And also be thinking about other treatments you've seen elsewhere that, that this discussion might remind you of that you want to bring up or talk about. And here is a list of resources that um, we frequently reference and might be useful for you all to be aware of. So there's the Highway Safety Manual created by the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, AASHTO, which is used to quantitatively evaluate traffic safety performance. Um, we also have referred to the MMUTCD, which stands for the Michigan Manual on, on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Um, that has standards for signage, pavement markings, traffic signals, et cetera, and um, MDOT's version of that complies with the, the Federal Highway Administration's MUTCD. And then we also refer to NACTO a lot. They have great publications about designing for bikes, heads, and transit, and they came out with a great Streets for Pandemic Response and Recovery publication that illustrates some um, some cool temporary or permanent design options that cities can consider, especially in downtown districts. Um, the NCHRP, National Cooperative Highway Research Program, they published a, um, a document about intersection design enhancements that we referenced when we were looking at Brown Street. And MDOT also has some resources worth looking at. And then the two, um, Funding opportunities listed on the bottom are funding sources to keep in mind when we talk about the varying costs of some of these interventions. And lastly, before we get into this, you should all be aware of how great of a resource SEMCOG is. They have a lot of open data and interactive mapping with transportation data on their website, and it's easy to look at things like traffic volumes and crash types, locations, and severity when thinking about what kind of design intervention might be appropriate. Um, so our first pedestrian topic is bump outs and curb extensions. Um, you might be most familiar with bump outs as a way to decrease the pedestrian crossing distance, which makes it easier to cross. And this is known to have a traffic calming effect and slow vehicles. And it can also serve as um, for like green stormwater infrastructure and beautification purposes and make room for amenities like seating or sidewalk cafes. And um, implementing these can range in cost and they're most commonly implemented when a street reconstruction or utility project is already scheduled. Um, and that's definitely the most uh, uh, cost effective way of doing projects like this. But um, sometimes when reconstruction is years away and you want to implement something more immediate, you can install bump outs for a more moderate cost um, in, in spot places. And the city could also consider less expensive options like paint and movable planners. And these two examples are both from the city of Birmingham, Old Woodward and Lincoln. And then um, our next topic is tighter corner radii. So 
installing tighter corner radii follows a similar logic to why you would want to implement bump outs. Um, excessively wide curb radii create greater design speeds for vehicles turning off high-speed roads such as Woodward and even if the pedestrian crossing is set back a little bit from the outside curb it still creates an unsafe or uncomfortable pedestrian environment when vehicles make the turn at high speeds and visibility might be poor for drivers and pedestrians and there also might not be signage allowing drivers to yield to pedestrians. I know that's something I've experienced crossing along Woodward. Um, and the diagrams on the bottom of the slide are from NACTO. The one on the left illustrates how a stop bar could be moved back to accommodate larger turning vehicles, which is an alternative to designing a super wide corner radius. And it's also worth noting that pushing the stop bars back at intersections is a proven pedestrian safety measure as well. Um, and then the diagram on the bottom right shows that when the curbside lane is used for parking or loading, or if it's a bike lane, something other than, than a car travel lane, then um, cars have a larger buffer from the curb when they're turning right. So large corner radii are even less necessary here. And there's also something called mountable curbs that act as an extension of the sidewalk, but can weather the occasional large truck or bus turning over it, which would allow you to design something that um, that favors pedestrians like 99% of the time and, and like I said, normally acts as a sidewalk, but can handle a large truck or bus turning over it. And some of the board members have been around remember the phase one of Maple and Old Woodward. That's what we did there. It was sort of a flush curb at the corner with bollards. And uh, more recently, when we're working on phase two at, at uh, Maple and Peabody, um, where there's kind of was a sweeping turn, those of you that weren't involved in the board at that time, the board looked at a number of alternatives and Julie Kroll put together a number of alternatives to really look at getting rid of, they kind of call it a slip lane, that fast weaving lane, you come off Big Woodward, you take that short segment on, on Maple and then go north. And, uh, and we went out there and videoed and it was very uncomfortable for pedestrians drivers weren't looking for them so the same kind of approach that's this is sort of demonstrating what we did there we made the radius tighter we got rid of that sweeping turn um the board spent a lot of time looking at the crosswalk and the placement of the signal to make that a better pedestrian crossing so this idea of tighter corner radii we've applied it a couple times on maple recently and Next, we have leading pedestrian intervals, or LPIs, which is when the walk signal turns green anywhere from three to seven seconds, typically before the light turns green for vehicles, which provides a head start for pedestrians to establish a presence in the crosswalk before cars start turning. And it's been proven to increase yielding, and it also provides additional crossing time for those who need it. And uh, we wanted to note that these have actually already been implemented throughout downtown Birmingham starting about two years ago. And um, I'm sure later Julie or Jana could speak to which locations those can be found at if anyone's curious. But they're extremely cost effective because they use existing infrastructure, the existing signals, and they're most effective in areas with high turning volumes. They're, they're primarily used to address conflicts between pedestrians and left turning vehicles, but they can also be used where there's a, a high volume of vehicles turning right. That being said, they, they may be slightly less effective in these situations um, with right turning vehicles if there's not a right on red restriction. And in some instances, they can add an ever so slight vehicle delay, but in most instances, it's negligible. And I think one of the reasons we wanted to throw this in there, one of the board members has said, well, let's look at some innovative things other communities are doing. So this is one that's sort of subtle and you may not recognize or even be aware of until we brought it up. And uh, Julie can mention it, but Julie's been contacted by other organizations because they think this might be the largest application of this type of leading pedestrian intervals in Michigan. I mean, Detroit's been talking about it on East Jefferson and other places, but it's relatively new, but Birmingham started doing it a couple of years ago when virtually before anybody else. Julie, anything to add? 
Yeah, I was just going to mention, I, I, I um, presented what we were doing with LPIs a few years ago at a, a technical conference, and I was approached by um, FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration um, liaison, he had a Lansing, um, and said that um, he wanted to see how Birmingham, how this actually was working, because um, there's only a few locations throughout the state. Um, Ann Arbor is one that has implemented these LPIs, but on a limited basis. So to implement them on a citywide basis, he was curious to see how they were going to be effective over the next um, few years. So um, that might be something that the, the board would be interested to get some feedback from the residents on how they like the LPIs and how they're working and if adjustments need to be made, et cetera. But, um, you know, I, I have not heard anything um, from Austin or Jana or anyone at the city um, regarding um, any concerns regarding the LPIs, but we, we have gotten feedback that they are helpful at many locations, through, especially through the downtown. So. The only thing that we've heard is, is good things from residents, pedestrians, they, they seem to really like them. Next topic. Hey, ben, let me just ask a quick question. Um, yes. Do you want any questions as we go along or do you want us to hold our questions till the end? Or I guess I just want to, it seems like a little bit more informal, informal but formal. I just want to know what you're thinking. Um, I'm open to either. I, I assume that we would hold off until the end, but I'm, I'm open to doing that now. I'm kind of thinking since each slide is its own topic, if you have something specific on a, that topic, it'd probably be fine to ask during that slide. If it's general stuff, then maybe till the end, we have a discussion slide at the end. So. Well, maybe we just see your point, Brad. Like, if, are there any questions at this point? Maybe every couple slides we just pause. Um, sure. And then um, I, I guess, Jana, do we have anyone from the public on? I was trying to determine that to know whether or not we needed to open it up at all as we get closer to the end i do not see any members of the public on the it's the board members staff and our closed captioners okay and, and our so, consultants obviously but uh, i don't see yeah. any members of the public at all okay so let's just pause there for one second ben is there any questions from the board at this point or, or comments to make on the slides we've seen thus far come off mute on your own, I think. If not, we'll just keep going. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Brad. Good. Yep. Um, so it's, it's really important to think about the frequency of pedestrian crossings along roads with a lot of pedestrian destinations and that also happen to have moderate to high traffic volumes like Woodward and Maple, Adams, Lincoln, Oak, and throughout downtown. And the location of crossing should be prioritized around bus stops, schools, parks and plazas, senior housing, alley crossings, which we're going to talk more about later, and, and neighborhood business districts. And while most streets downtown have marked pedestrian crossings at every corner, there may be a handful of locations where it would be worth considering additional mid-block crossings to accommodate high pedestrian volumes and destinations on both sides of the street. And if designed well, the crossings can also function as a traffic calming tool. So that's something to keep in mind for specific streets. And Cross Street in the Depot Town District of Ypsilanti is a great example of some closely spaced pedestrian crossings along their historic commercial district there that really successfully calm traffic and prioritize pedestrian circulation. And then the bottom photo is uh, the recent Normandy Road reconstruction project in Royal Oak, which is a great example of a really nice looking mid-block crossing being implemented with a refuge island and clear markings and lots of signage so that a stop sign or a signal um, wasn't necessary or warranted with the crossing. And I didn't know Ben, but that cross street crossing, that was my design like 
long ago. That's an MDOT road, and MDOT said they would never do it, and then that became the first one on an MDOT road. So. I know that. <laughs> um, never say so, never. <laughs> exactly. And the, the woman who approved it at MDOT got in trouble because I'd work elsewhere in Michigan, and MDOT staff would say, we, we never allow that on an MDOT road, and I had this photo with me all the time, and I'd say, yes, you do. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so, so installing crossings like these can vary from pretty cheap to moderately expensive, depending on if you're just striping a crossing or if you want to use a material like stamped brick or construct a refuge island. However, um, the, the more expensive versions of these projects, like a lot of these other interventions, are often paired with planned repaving or reconstruction, so that's a great way to offset a lot of the cost, and also um, wanted to note that crossing locations all over the city are highlighted in the draft master plan for different types of improvements that adhere to uh, more closely to these spacing and design principles that we're talking about. And there's also been a lot of talk and organizing around making Woodward safer to cross for pedestrians. And this slide includes some context to keep in mind and a couple of illustrations of characteristics of successful crossings on really wide thoroughfares at major intersections and between mile roads. So the top rendering is a proposed design that MKSK prepared for an enhanced pedestrian crossing on Mound Road in Sterling Heights, and it has a stamped brick, colored stamped brick crosswalk and really nice landscaping in the median, and it's not terribly different from what you find at some of the mile road intersections um, on along Woodward and Oakland County. And the lower image is a mid-block crossing of M59 in Clinton Township that's clearly marked and landscaped and landscaped nicely and was able to be squeezed between two median crossovers that um, operate on separate light phases. So that's something that's also applicable to Woodward. And crossing designs like these on Woodward need MDOT approval because it's an MDOT road, but um, adjacent to bus stops along Woodward is one place where additional crossings would make a big difference for people riding the 450 and 460 buses or just crossing downtown um, to get to the Triangle District or the, some of the neighborhoods. And like, again, like the other types of design treatments we're talking about, these are most often considered um, in alignment with a repaving or reconstruction project. And there are funding opportunities like the Transportation Alternatives Program or that the acronym for that is TAP, and that's a, a federally funded grant program that's administered through MDOT, and that's definitely worth looking into. Um, and again, um, connecting this back to the draft master plan, um, several of the highlighted intersections in the draft plan are located along Woodward. So again, these principles are good to keep in mind. And now on to bike facilities. So the city's draft plan includes bike lanes on Lincoln, Brown, Adams, Maple, and Cranbrook. And it's important to think about what makes a bike facility safe and comfortable for someone, for someone taking their kids out on a ride around the neighborhood versus someone who wears bike tights and bike commutes to downtown Detroit every day. Very different users. So on quiet neighborhood streets, things like sharrows and signage and traffic calming might be enough, but on busier streets, some sort of physical protection from traffic should be considered where there's room for it. So the Livernoy streetscape projects in Ferndale and Detroit are both great examples of installing safe bike facilities in different contexts and on very different budgets. In Detroit, they removed the median on Livernoy so they could neck down the road to create super wide sidewalks with raised bike paths and the bike paths are buffered from parked cars and pedestrians um, with trees and green stormwater infrastructure. And 
Um, and then up to Ferndale, if you don't have such a large budget or if you're implementing a project without repaving or reconstruction, then painted buffers and physical barriers like delineator posts are also really effective, like we see on Livernoy and Ferndale. And um, alternatives to providing protection with flexible posts include on-street parking, jersey barriers, and movable planners. And planners are, are um, a pretty popular option because they can really help beautify a project. And in terms of the width necessary for implementing facilities like this, um, a protected bike lane, I think it can be as narrow as seven feet, so five feet for the bike lane and two to three feet for a buffer. But on Livernoy in Ferndale, the bike lane gets as wide as seven feet plus a five foot buffer, which creates a really great rider experience. Um, and when we're planning for these separated bike facilities, we can't forget about carrying them through intersections, which brings us to the next topic, bicycle intersection treatments. So there's a variety of different intersection treatments with varying costs and implementation factors, but the key factors to keep in mind when designing for bicycles are visually carrying marked facilities through the entire intersection, um, accommodating bicycle left turns, protecting bicyclists from right and left turning vehicles, and creating safe mixing situations between bicycles and vehicles that are entering a right turn pocket. So um, the treatment on the left hand side of the screen, mixing zone treatments, usually just includes paint and signage, and there's a few different ways to design it depending on what type of bike facility you have and how much roadway you have to play with. But the main objective is to start bike and car mixing with clear signage and pavement markings far enough in advance of the intersection to create to um, prevent dangerous um, conflicts or situations uh, leading right up to the intersection. And the middle photo shows bike boxes on Livernoy and Ferndale, which allow bikes to queue ahead of cars at an intersection. It gives bikes a head start, which is a, kind of a similar principle to the, the leading pedestrian intervals that we talked about earlier. It, it allows them to make left turns before the traffic behind them. And then lastly, we have on the right protected intersections, the gold standard of bicycle intersection design. And I think this one is from Chicago. Um, and these are designed to protect bicycles from turning vehicles by using the buffer to between the bike lane and the travel lane to improve visibility between bikes and drivers. And these designs also shorten the crossing distance for bicyclists and they create space for pedestrian refuge islands. Um, and the only caveat about these is there's usually a little bit more space required because of the buffer. And Brad, I, think I guess I should ask, are there any questions? Another, like a break for any discussion or questions on those last few slides. Um, this is Joe. I, I had a quick point um, or maybe question with regard to the arterial intersections uh, slide. Um, so I live pretty close to Woodward on the uh, on the east side, and so I end up having to cross Woodward a lot. Um, and there's one crossing in particular that I'm. Uh, th there, that's just south of Maple, right by the AAA, and uh, you, you cross it, and do you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah, the crossing at Forest? Probably that one. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And um, I never feel safe crossing. I'm always, I always feel like I'm taking my life in my hands, uh, and especially when I have young kids. So I guess um, I, I'm bringing it up because it's fine on the other side of of, uh, of Woodward on the uh, southbound side of Woodward, but it is a um, because there's a light there, so it's not that, that big of a deal. But like this one uh, on the northbound side, there are always people 
turning left in there and um, it seems like the traffic never lets up. Um, I guess I, I'm just curious about ways that we could look at that or similar situations because there's definitely periods of uh, spots along Woodward that uh, there's a big gap between uh, crosswalks and how we can consider uh, to, to do that a, a little bit safer for pedestrians. Yeah, I think Ferndale has been working with MDOT on looking at some of their crossings and uh, there's a project actually Ben and I are working on called the Woodward Mobility Oriented uh, Development Project, which is involved MDOT and the Regional Transit um, Authority. And Jan has been at several of those workshops and we've been talking all the communities up and down Woodward, except I think Bloomfield Hills, but all the other ones have talked about the same issue, having more frequent and better design coming up with a new standard. That's why we wanted to show that M59, because in some cases, that would be able to connect between those one-sided signals. Like from when I've walked the forest one, I have the same feeling you do. The, the drivers think you're in their way. Um, I think things that could be done there would be to really accentuate that crossing. You could have flashing you know, beacons. So I think um, kind of the idea of this training, since we had a light agenda is here with some of the board ideas are, and, and I think Jana, we could probably get some discussions going with MDOT like the city did a few years ago to get some improvements on, uh, on Woodward and maybe this time focus on pedestrian crossings at Maple, um, but also this one and maybe even farther south. So. If I could jump in here, I just wanna let you know that it's interesting you bring that this one up because we have met with MDOT many times over the years with regards to this particular crossing because it does work pretty well on the south bound side but there's no light equivalent on the northbound side we've talked to them about putting in a light we've talked to them about putting in a flashing beacon like one of those hawk signs we've talked to them about moving that lane for the the u-turn we've talked about all kinds of things and we have been unsuccessful so far in working out any sort of option that they think is feasible so it, it is on the radar it's so far has not been a, an easy sell with MDOT, but it's still on our radar. That well, helps. If, if you ever need anybody to uh, emphasize the point at a meeting, I'd be happy to speak up. So just let me know. Sounds good. But it's, it, it, this is, I mean, this is the one, one that I know because it's close to where I live, but there's also sp spots f further south where there's, you have to walk pretty far to be able to cross Woodward. And I think that, you know, Sometimes people end up jaywalking, which is not ever safe on Woodward. So, you know, just uh, um, definitely something to keep in mind. So that's all I have. Thank you. I have a question, if I can. On the um, next slide, I think it was. One with the bike lanes and the buffered bike lanes. Uh, sorry, keep going. I beg your pardon. This one. On the protected intersection, what we see here is uh, looks like strips of sidewalk. Do we have any experience in in the US or in this region with instead of having you know five or six foot wide sidewalk strips and putting in things like bell bollards? I know they're very, very um, successful in at least the UK where I come from and they're quite widely employed and they're not terribly obtrusive. Do we have anything similar, any similar application, if not necessarily in Michigan, in other large cities like um, in Boston and, and the East Coast are more likely to have something like that? Are you talking about the bollards that would go like in these little yeah, because you don't have to have such a broad strip for them, but, and specifically Bell Bollard is the name that they, at least that's what they call them back home, because they literally look like bells because they're designed to deflect vehicle wheels gently. Um, but you need a much narrower space to put them in to have, instead of just having a big wide sidewalk, which as you mentioned, takes up a lot of space and you need a lot of space for it. You could put in this, this buffering with less, horizontal width being needed. Uh, I'm, I can't think of any 
Dell, Ballard applications in the U.S. off the top of my head. I don't know about you, Brad or Julie. No, I think Boston has some Ballards, maybe Minneapolis. We'll have to, to look and see. There's, I think Toronto has done some of that more than the U.S. cities I can think of right now, but uh, we'll, we'll take a look and think about it some more, see if we can come up with, with some options. But I, I have seen it in Boston, but maybe not that exact application. You know the exact type of bollard I'm talking about, though, right? Yep. yep. Yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure they do have them in Toronto. Yep. I think that's where I've seen them. I did a complete street walk in Toronto or tour a few years ago. Yeah, that is a good point that um, sometimes, like, different color paint and some sort of object, whether it's a bollard or some like a flexible post, is an alternative to constructing a solid in the middle of the street. I've learned not to be a fan of the flexible posts because every single one I've seen has been obliterated by an idiot in a truck. The bell bollard I like because it, if, if you hit it gently, it does zero damage to the vehicle. It literally guides your wheels away from it. But if you hit it hard, there's a lovely YouTube video of a truck in the city of London with its trailer wheels destroyed because it decided to hit it hard. But the bollard did its job perfectly in protecting the pedestrians that are on the sidewalk because someone videoed it right after it happened and there's people standing where it was going to wipe them out. So it, it's, it's just because it's aesthetically pleasing, it's not obtrusive and it might fit with the overall integration into the city appearance as opposed to having great big steel blocks or anything else. That's why I was thinking of them. Good consideration. Just an idea, thank you. Kind of the next topic, just going to talk about some general traffic calming while that slide uh, loads up. Some of the board members might remember a couple of years ago, the city commission wanted the board to look at standards to narrow residential street widths with the idea of more narrow street width would reduce speeds and help calm traffic. And there was a lot of some public outcry um, there wasn't a lot of agreement at the board. Uh, there, we were asked to do some research on was there a demonstrated difference in speed of these were like taking a 26 foot wide road and making it 24 and so forth. And there, I think there wasn't enough compelling information of the influence on speed to get the board to have a consensus and to get the city commission to make a change. So it was kind of put aside. Uh, but based on the surveys you wanted to talk about, uh, traffic calming is interesting. The thing that Andrew just brought up with like the flexible bollards, some communities for traffic calming are using art and other things at intersections um, that wouldn't work probably as well in the Northern climate, but some creative ways of adding art uh, right on the corners, um, putting things sometimes right in the pavement to make it uh, difficult. It's kind of like tightening up that radius and giving the pedestrians a, a buffer in a way different from a bollard. But anyway, one of the techniques that's that's used in some communities. I know Farmington Hills does this a lot. Um, maybe Troy in residential areas, instead of narrowing the streets, which can be expensive and, and have opposition, is looking at speed humps. And speed humps aren't like a speed bump, but they're, um, and there's different versions. There's a speed table, sinusoidal speed hump. There's different ones. The ones shown on the photos to the right are the simplest and least expensive ones. The one in Detroit shown below is kind of more of a, it looks temporary, but it, it's something that goes in less expensively and can be removed. If you've been to like St. Petersburg, Florida, or other cities that have put them in very decoratively with um, like look like brick and have a lot of really nice features, Toronto has the same thing on their speed humps. So they're, as you get more expensive, you can make them really more attractive. These are kind of the lower cost application. But the idea of these speed Humps is to slow vehicles down in the middle of a block between stop signs or, or intersections. You have to have the right pace of them or sequence to avoid people like they do at stop signs, stop and then speed up to the next stop sign, speed up to the next stop sign. So there's sort of a science based on the street design and the distance. Um, but we looked at an ITE study and see pretty significant reduction in speeds along the route, uh, especially people that are driving way too fast. So if you remember the drawings or images we've shown at some previous board trainings of a pedestrian hit by a car going 25 has a much greater chance to survive than one hit by a vehicle going 30 or 35. And so they do these 
speed humps is to get people down to 25 miles per hour as a traveling speed. So these can be effective in places where you're observing that a lot of the traffic is going 30 or 32 miles an hour, and it tends to drop them back down into that 24 to 28 miles per hour that can be very important to, to safety. Um, they can be a little bit troublesome for snow plowing. So there's, there's kind of a science to the, the width and the height so that the snow plows can go right over it without um, any effort. So we can't really in our climate do the same kind of a speed hump that they could do in St. Petersburg, Florida, but they still can be, be pretty effective. You more often see these within a neighborhood street, not on a, like a collector street. Any questions on speed humps? You mentioned speed tables. Um, I, I'm painfully familiar with speed humps and speed tables in the UK. Um, is there any data on snow plows and speed tables? Because they do have a, a significantly wider flat top surface area to enable snow plows to maybe get over them and, and be less obstructed. Do we yep, we've kind of got an image of a speed table coming up, although it's an intersection, but speed tables are a lot less disruptive for the snow plowing. So they, they are more expensive. They're more effective than a speed hump. Um, they also usually give the pedestrian a place to cross and that they are um, fire departments and snow plowers tend to prefer those over a speed hump. Yes, next one, Ben. Can I just add one thing that there is a speed table over there in front of the Troy Transit Center on Doyle Drive for anybody that's familiar with as you go around the curve. Curve, sorry. Mm -hmm. Another traffic calming and pedestrian benefit, we talked about a couple of these options when we did our Brown Road uh, little workshop, but is uh, just different types of pinch points. So Ben already showed the, you know, the Normandy, it can be a, an island um, for the, where the pedestrians cross at the island. It can be an island right before the pedestrian crossing to kind of alert the driver that there's a crossing there like you see on, um, on Grand River and Farmington. So it's Farmington Hills, but sorry, it's actually downtown Farmington. And then we have something similar on the um, Old Woodward and Maple and Birmingham. And the idea of these pinch points is basically where you have a pedestrian crossing at a mid block is you're reducing the width that the pedestrian has to cross. It alerts the driver that there's a pedestrian crossing there. They, they um, could just put in a pedestrian crossing with a sign, like Berkeley did that on Coolidge and without any flashing beacons or without any pinch points or anything else, and, and a couple of pedestrians unfortunately were hit because they weren't, the drivers weren't expecting somebody to cross. The pedestrians had a sort of false sense of safety that they were crossing on a crosswalk and would be safe. So you really need for these pinch points to be well-designed, alert the driver, things like signs, like the one you have in Old Order in Birmingham or flashing beacons or other things or a change of pavement or very bold pedestrian markings um, are, are an alternative. Um, pedestrians tend to prefer this type of crossing over uh, a speed hump. So. Uh, maybe next one. So then the raised intersections or speed tables are less common, um, but as Jenny said, we have one in Birmingham that I'd forgotten about. This is, uh, these are some images and Julie can talk about it, but that Lisa and Vandenbrink did, but the one on the uh, lower right just shows um, this allows the sidewalk to stay flush. So the vehicle goes up and then kind of over the sidewalk and back down. So it has the effect of a speed hump, but it's a little less abrupt. And then the pedestrian doesn't have to step down and step back up. So it's much better for people with mobility impairments or in a wheelchair. Um, and it's really a pedestrian focused. The one in Howard City, um, and we did this something similar in Midland is a raised intersection where the whole intersection comes up. So the cars are aware it's a pedestrian priority intersection because they go up, they have to slow down and the pedestrian has a, a flat crossing. Um, so these are becoming more and more common, especially on the edge of a downtown or at a major pedestrian crossing where you really need to slow the vehicles down. Um, they reduce the speed you can still accommodate all the different vehicles. Um, they can get expensive depending on the materials that you use. 
it can be a little tricky in terms of the drainage. So you've got to be, you know, careful of the drainage and sometimes bringing in fill. But generally, as we got in the green box on the lower left, ITE has done some studies of these speed tables and raised intersections, and they're pretty effective at lowering the people that are speeding through an intersection, and they tend to really raise the pedestrian activity and the pedestrian comfort. Um, I've seen, trying to think of some other places we've seen these. We're talking about doing this in a, another project, but I worked one on in Finley, Ohio. Um, I've seen them in Asheville, North Carolina, and um, Madison, Wisconsin. And so it's become, they work pretty well in our climate. So I know, Julie, if you want to explain the experience of FNB and, and your experience on raised intersections and speed tables. So these ones came out of our, our our landscape architecture group. That's why they look so pretty. I don't, my group doesn't design anything pretty. But uh, uh, so the, I think the Howard City one was more like a streetscape. And so as part of the streetscape design that they did in Howard City, and they were basically, as opposed to focusing on the traffic, they were focusing on the pedestrian experience. And as part of that, they developed this speed table. So a raised intersection to focus on pedestrian activity in the downtown in Howard City. Um, the one in the lower right is actually um, an alleyway. So that is a, uh, a raised um, a speed table as you're entering into an alley. So that's actually um, the a much lower cost for that, but it was a way for uh, vehicles to um, on approach in an, to understand that there's pedestrians crossing um, at this alleyway. So that was just um, a little bit uh, different than the Howard City, but, but similar treatment. All right, uh, next. Next is a little bit more elaborate, but it's sort of that raised intersection, but raising the whole street and making a kind of a curbless street that is um, very pedestrian friendly. Vehicles can still go on it. Typically it has different pavement material and it slows vehicles down, but it's to make it a lot easier to cross. So this might be the type of thing you could see like around Shane Park or something. So um, Hudsonville, Harvey Avenue, um, Julie's firm worked on that over uh, just west of Grand Rapids. Well, we do a lot of work in Traverse City. This is the street in Traverse City. Um, we've designed something a couple years ago as part of a team that was just installed in downtown Midland where we removed signals, actually replaced all the downtown signals there with stop signs and made the street flush. And, uh, and it's worked really well. The Traverse City one, I think the planning director there would say they learned a lesson. They didn't make enough distinction between the parking lane and the pedestrian zone and the travel lanes. Um, so they would probably do it a little bit differently. I think the one in Hudsonville has done really well where it's very clear kind of the prior, priority pedestrian walk zone and the vehicle zone and, and loading and unloading. And the Midland did sort of the Midland separates the parking lanes with some decorative bollards and um, green infrastructure uh, landscape beds. So um, these are pretty expensive. You tend to see them in your very high pedestrian areas. Um, where you really want to slow vehicles down, still accommodate parking and, and vehicles. But uh, anyway, that's a design. I think um, I worked in Dearborn. Dearborn has talked about this for, I'm forgetting the street name, but the street that is just south of Michigan Avenue, uh, like by, if you know where Ford's garage is, but that street along there, they've talked about doing the same thing of a, like a raised street and a shared street. And Ben mentioned early on, um, you know, sort of the NACTO, the pandemic. So, uh, a number of communities, like we work with the city of Louisville, uh, Birmingham talked about this. We work with Kalamazoo where they've closed streets during the COVID-19 and just either left them open just for pedestrians and outdoor seating, or they have done things to really reduce the volume and speed going through. They still allow people to go in and park, but they've converted part of the street area to be much more um, of a pedestrian street or maybe allowing outdoor parking. So. Um, Anyway, that's just another option of some interesting things that some communities around the country and around Michigan are doing. And that's kind of our overview of some training on pedestrian and alley, um, pedestrians and traffic calmings and bike facilities in response to your survey. There was, we had a couple of board meetings ago, we talked about the alleys on Woodward 
And so Ben and I have gone out and looked at those. Jan and I looked at them before. And uh, if you're still interested, we can do a similar session on sort of best practices in alleyways, which could include the alleys in downtown, but also the alleys along Woodward and the, the crossing at Lincoln that we talked about a couple meetings ago. Uh, do you have to take any other questions to see if this is helpful to you? If you want to hear about alleys or any other topic, and this is something we can do in any um, month where we have a light agenda, be ready with a, the next training. I know I would appreciate I'd that. like to hear about the alleys. Um, yeah, there's plans for alleys in part of the 2040 plan where some of them are being converted, um, kind of more along the area around where Joe and I live. There's um, plans for pushing back and using them. So yes, conversion themes would be very, very helpful to understand the 2040 plan a bit better. Well, thank you very much to all of our consultants for that. I think that was very helpful. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, Does Birmingham have any plan for the alleys? Like, is there any, I know there's like a little bit of decorative stuff and I spent more time in the alleys last weekend. We were doing family photos. <laughs> so, but is there any like plan for the alleys? Is there an alley plan that I don't know about? There is, there's an alleys and passages plan. It's called, uh, oh, I'm gonna forget the name. Um, something like designing urban spaces, the VIA plan or something to that effect. Uh, we completed it in 2012. Uh, it's on the website if you wanted to go on there and look at it. Um, we've done several of the improvements already. It deals with public art. It deals with terminating vistas. It deals with um, making them more walkable. It highlights some of the alleys and passages that we already have. It designates them, uh, classifies them. There's uh, uh, three different types that are in there. There's the mixed traffic. So you get vehicles and cars, then there's the pedestrian vias only, then there's what we call destination vias, where a lot of them come together, or there's a lot of activity, or maybe we want to highlight uh, doing some something special back there. So yes, we do have a plan, and I'd, I'd welcome you to take a look at it. I think Brad uh, is probably familiar with it too, so he'll probably be looking at that again uh, when he does or when his team does the presentation on uh, alleys. But yes, and we also did just recently back in August, I think it was a terminating VISTA report that the Public Arts Board actually did. So it was more from a Public Arts Board standpoint, but it also talked a little bit about alleys. So it wasn't an alley plan per se, but it did talk a little bit about it. Cause you know, when you come down and you walk into an alley, the one in particular I'm thinking of is the one uh, next to Social on Maple on East Maple, where you walk north, uh, up the alley, alongside Social, and then there's uh, the alley then splits and goes east and west, and then it's there's a big huge building right at the very end, and it's sort of a, a dead concrete wall. So that is um, one area that we talked about doing something um, with regards to public art there as a terminating vista. So just those are the couple of things that we have that are going on right now dealing with alleys. And I think that there's been some investment in the city on the like the functional aspects of a couple of the downtown alleys to redo the pavement and clean them up and everything, but maybe not a lot about the the art and making them more vibrant and comfortable. So they're kind of cool to take a photo for, you know, your your high school graduation photo, kind kind of gritty, and that can be the the style you want. Or but there are other things that could be done with lighting and making a more flexible space and so forth. So. Um, when we do this next presentation, we can cover some of that. We'll look at the alley plan. I didn't realize the arts group had a, a plan and we can show some of the alleys and then what some other places are doing because that could be a project that the board might want to kind of push within the city. And then I think when it's the Woodward, there's been more attention spent on Woodward, but Woodward, I think we would look at the parking and how to make those alleys work. And then especially, you know, are there things we can do to make the crossings easier because the pedestrians walking and biking along the alleys really a lot more now than, than ever before. They don't want to walk up to Woodward and then come back to the alley and, you know, every block do that. They're crossing at the alleys and they're bicycling through the alleys. So looking at ways to accentuate those crossings could be part of it too. Okay. Um, looks like we, we had really good conversation on this topic and uh, look forward to some more on alleys and, um, more training sessions that came out of the, the surveys. Um, was there anything else in, in this topic that didn't sound like to me? I just wanted to double check. 
Okay. Um, with that, I know we were talking about having a discussion on ADA, and I still don't see Commander Gruy. I know there were several pictures and um, lots and lots of pages. Mm -hmm. Uh, to read. Jana, any quick update on that one or do we want to push? Yes, it? I actually did get a hold of, of Commander Gruy via text and he is not at home tonight nor in the office and where he was he thought that he would have service but he was unable to connect so okay. he can't, he, he would ask that we may, he first of all says he's very sorry uh, asked if we can move this to the next meeting because while he has his phone that he could join the meeting on he wouldn't be able to, to go through his PowerPoint. So. Yeah, I I'd, I'd like to spend more than a more than a brief minute on it. So yeah, if if the board doesn't mind, let's um let's punt it to uh, next meeting. Okay, that sounds okay. good. I think that those were the two topics on the agenda tonight. So if there isn't anything else or um, items that are uh, that we want to talk about that aren't on the agenda. I just have one thing, and that's to deal with virtual meetings, just so that everybody knows um, the state legislature has allowed virtual meetings to continue through the end of the year, um, then for basically because of the pandemic. After January, though, there are specific things. So it has to be, um, I think there has to be a state of emergency declared or a couple of other things. So hang in, I guess that's my point. In December, there'll definitely be a virtual meeting. My guess is things will change again uh, come January, and they'll probably continue this even after January, the way the cases are spiking up right now. But just so you know, that, that's, that's what goes on. And the only other change for us, as uh, was pointed out at the beginning of the meeting, you have to state your city and state that you're sitting in to do the virtual meeting. So December will still be virtual. Okay, well, we'll give everybody a little time back and look forward to the ADA topic um, next meeting. And so we'll close the meeting at uh, 6.58. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Have Thanks. a good night. Thanks. Have a good night.